All right. All set. Well done, Marina. The uh, purpose of the uh, public hearing tonight is to discuss and get input on uh, proposed changes to the Andover zoning regulations, specifically section 4.11 accessory apartments, 4.21 lighting, section 5 licensed daycare, section 7 licensed daycare, section 15 signs, section 23 lighting, height and intensity, and section 24 definitions. Um, Mark Brantz, have you joined us yet? Okay, I particularly wanted Mark here for the accessory apartment discussions. So that uh, means we'll go down to lighting, which we do have a couple of people that uh, that are looking to hear on that. And uh, Marina, if you can allow me to share my screen. Sure. Okay. Go ahead. Okay, so um, on this, you know, Eric representing the town of Andover asked to have uh, a paragraph on section 4.21 lighting added that said, Modifications to section 4.21 may be permitted by the commission by special permit where it can be demonstrated to the commission that compliance is not practical for a public recreational facility. Um, so, Eric, uh, I will ask you, is it, so I, I think it's the town's intention that these preliminary uh, caveats 4.21.1 through 0.6 would not apply for the public recreational facility. So the goal was for the commission to, to protect its rights by making any modifications be done via special permit but that this just acknowledges the fact essentially that if you're going to light an athletic field the lighting requirements are generally higher than that for a parking lot um, which is what our current regulations are essentially designed for um, and that in some cases it is difficult to meet all the requirements of the lighting regulations in the zoning districts, um, you know, for an athletic field. Right. So that if the town is going to pursue that, then making that, you know, okay. using- There's a problem for some reason. If you use the, the logging information on the calendar, Okay, mute yourself, Jim. We yes. can hear you. You're trying to, uh, I think you're no, trying to get calendar on the town's on. calendar. And the town's calendar. Yeah, I mean, I put the agenda together and that was. I think the administrator can mute him. Yeah, Marina. If you go to the calendar, you should. Yeah, um, yeah I was just going to see if I can do that. Let me give you the. Okay. That's better. Okay. So, yep. So the, the goal is just to allow a special permit application to relax the lighting rules specifically for an athletic field. Um, but only after you do a lighting study and you say, what can you comply with and what can't you comply with? That was the intention of it. Okay. Um... <clears throat> And, you know, I know I'm thinking out loud. I know we're not allowed to deliberate at this point, but each of the items here, well, one, I think the section might be totally redundant with section 23, because I see all these 
same things in section 23. But the fact uh, you know that we should be shielding the light source and be dark sky compliant and lighting at the uh, property lines not to exceed 0.2 lumens. My thought are my thought is that it's even more important for a bright light than it is a dim light. Um, and I don't know if it's possible or not, but I think it's probably possible. Well, I know it's I know it's possible. It's just a question of does it make uh, you know a situation even worse than it is? The uh, the pamphlet that uh, John shared with us the other day on light intrusion, uh, you know, talked about you know, putting up fences along the property line to prevent the the light from going across and all that kind of stuff. Um, I don't think uh, I'd be inclined to uh, to think that would be in keeping our sense of uh, Andover, but but anyhow, uh, you know, I do have. I still have some concerns at this point about, you know, do we want to maintain these requirements or not? And, and we'll get there in the deliberation. I've, I've said my piece on that. Uh, do any other commission members at this point have any questions or comments on this particular section here? Well, I feel the same way you do, Judge. The same, the regulation should still apply, or or a lot of them. They should. Yep. I, I understand you want to get a study, but this, this well, the light certainly can't go off of the property. A um, lighting, a lighting plant. Welcome, Mark. Hi, how you doing? Yeah. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, just to bring you up, uh, we, we did have a couple of people from the public, especially the neighbor across from the uh, the soccer field that uh, were able to get online. So I uh, decided we could uh, continue and hold a public hearing. We might uh, need to continue it based on uh, your recommendation when we get done. But um, no problem. That's, that, that's to, fine. It was, it was duly advertised that people are able to get in. That's fine. Yep. So so anyhow. Um, Okay, I heard uh, heard Scott say that uh, he thought these were good ideas. Do any other commission member have any comments at this point? I I do like the paragraph adding the special permit option for special situations, and but I I do also agree that the regulations need to contain the light for the specific application. So I think we can accomplish both um, and consider special circumstances for things like the athletic field under the special permit. My, my concern with, well, I'm not a fan of saying we can do a special permit, which would be required anyhow, there's, you know, even if he was going to comply with the regulations today, it would be by special permit. Mm -hmm. Even if he was to comply with the regulations today, it would take a light study and a light plan. So we're really not saying anything that we wouldn't be required with if we were to comply with the regulations today. Um, okay, so we wouldn't need to add that well, language? We... Maybe, maybe not. And uh, and this is to you know get the feel for where we're going. Um, the one of the very first meetings that I came into uh, the commission as an alternate was for a home business for uh, a fella out on Riverview Drive, and. Essentially, I was told that because it's a special permit, there are no requirements. And I didn't like that. I was a brand new guy and didn't make as much of a fuss as I probably should have at the time. But I do think we need to have something in that's going to 
the if if these limits in 21.1 through 6 aren't the limits what are the limits and what they're based on you know we we say in section 23 we're going to uh, no higher than 35 feet no brighter in any circumstances than 12 lumens and and we'll get to that in a minute but um i like i like these uh restrictions that we have they protect mm -hmm. the the dark sky they protect the neighbors um and that sort of thing and 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 at this point we're just trying to make sure we understand what the regulation change does for us then in to, to me the concern is that uh we uh we don't have an upper bounds once we get in here if they were to say that uh, the best we can do is 500 lumens on the neighbor's yard um i don't think that you know that's not good and we wouldn't approve that but but there ought to be something i think in there to uh, to limit it um any other commission members yeah i have a question the part that you have highlighted in yellow there the yep. uh, modifications that's the that's the that's, uh, paragraph that the town would like to have added okay and that applies only to these things that we see in red right now or does it apply to all of the lighting regulations this only this only pertains to what you see right here there's another uh -huh. A similar paragraph when we get into section 23 and we'll we're going to okay. go to section 23 lighting requirements next but okay. this this would tell you that it's not necessary to comply with with those upper six things yeah those look good at this point to me but i'd have to think about it a bit more to make my final decision okay got well. it the, the, your public hearing is still open, so you're not supposed to make any final decisions yet. Right. Yeah, I know. That. Uh, yeah. Um, just I, I, as as that indicated in my in my email uh, to you, Mr. Chairman of uh, of November second, um, there are there are legal problems with that yellow highlighted, um, in that the commission is not allowed to grant waivers. Um, I'd given you some alternative language that I, I don't know if the commission has that or not, or if, if that's come up yet. Um, I did not see the alternative language to this. I could go back and uh, and hunt for that. We didn't talk about it the other day when we were meeting, and that's probably that's. Well, I thought we did. I, it just the, the, the problem with the McKenzie with the wait the waiver oh, the waiver yeah. problem. No, I remember we discussed it. I just didn't remember that we had some uh, other language that we could put in here. I know we talked about uh, this intrusive lighting standard. The, you know, not to exceed or to you're required to comply with the intrusive lighting standard. And um, yeah, it's just the um, the, the 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 commissions aren't allowed to to waive their own regulations, but you are allowed to to specify uh, conditions under which they would not apply. So um, um. Uh, uh, actually, no. Some actually, you did. You did change this. You did change this. I'm sorry. You you changed this since I. Well, I think no, you didn't. No. I had um. For active recreation facilities the require. Remember, the, we've talked about the require amount of a higher mounting height. Yep, we'll get there. That's space. in twenty three. Okay. All right. Yeah. Enough. This in. Okay. Um, okay. Anybody else from the commission? Anybody from the public have a comment on this? Good evening, everyone. This is Eve Chikello. Um, We are at the corner of Long Hill and Riverside Drive, directly across from the soccer field. And the temporary lighting from the two additional light towers at the soccer field created a great deal of light pollution toward our farm this fall. Uh, unfortunately, the lighting shined into our house and created co a considerable glare in our living spaces until about, it was typically after 8 p.m. Um, the kids would leave at 8, 
the lights would start to get shut off and it was eventually, you know, all off by 820 or so. Um, my intent for joining tonight is to understand what the timeline goal is for the permanent lighting that's been discussed and the plan for directing the lights away from our property. Had the temporary lighting been faced towards the river, the glare wouldn't have been as intrusive. And we're just looking to discuss, you know, further options. Are those lights on tonight, Eve? No, the lights are not on tonight. Um, the permanent lights are on and those are fine. Yep. It's just the portable light towers and those two out of the three were hauled away last week. Okay. I think we're at the end of soccer season. And sure are. That happens so fast. <laughs> I, I I knew that would be a temporary solution for you that would make those go away, but clearly those lights were absolutely not in compliance with our lighting regulations. You know, they, they certainly weren't shielded so the light source cannot be seen from adjacent properties. <laughs> they were shining right in your windows. And so uh, I am sensitive to that was not the proper solution here. Um, and, and for the public hearing tonight, all we're, all the town is looking for is a lighting regulation for a generic athletic field. Now, just like when we were talking about the senior center, you know, we all had a pretty good idea where that senior center, you know, the town wanted to put that when we uh, we talked about that regulation change to allow it. But the town would have to come back with a special permit for specifically where they would like to light. So. While you know that the town would like to light up that soccer field, that's not what tonight's discussion's about. Should we modify the regulations to allow more lighting for athletic purposes on any field? There just don't happen to be a lot of them in town. Understood. Okay. Shannon, did you have any comments at this point? No, thank you for asking, Jed. Okay. Jim? John? Nothing for me. Mark, anything else at this point? I'm going to scroll down to that section 23 which is the other and uh, i'm struggling a little bit myself with i got a different computer and i've got old old word software on it and so my cutting and pasting's not too uh, not too good but here under 23.5 B3A are the modifications that essentially are currently existing in the change that the town would make. So if you looked in our regulations now, it said modification of this section, including lighting for all these things, it also had recreational facilities up here. So this is where may be permitted by a special permit, but in no event shall lighting fixture be higher than 35 feet, nor lumens greater than 12 per square foot. The town's perspective is that, that neither of those would be appropriate for lighting a soccer field. We would need to go higher so that we can shine the lights more directly down and eliminate the glare going out uh, on the road and, and in the neighbor's property. Um, and then if you look at uh, what are the the levels required for you know recreational fields, uh, I think that when when I looked up what what lighting do you need to have uh, for a soccer field, it the the range spanned, uh, orders of magnitude. I saw a number that was less 
than 12 lumens per square feet up to a thousand lumens per square feet. So you could get just about any number in there. Uh, there is a, a standard, if you will, for lighting of athletic fields. And, and I think that had uh, 20 or 30, which, which uh, would allow us to, to light the soccer field appropriately. That's 20 to 30 lumens per square foot. So a little, little bit more than what we allow now, which you know might have been based on, on a parking lot. Um, the, the thing that is I went back and looked at and I just, I'm going to stop sharing for a minute and see if I can call up something different. Does everybody see regulations now? Sometimes when I click on something, it doesn't change on the display you see. Yes, we see it. Yes. Yes. Okay. Sorry about this, but all your pictures are covering up my scroll spot so I can't scroll rapidly down. We're getting really close here. Okay, so here oh, we go. Yeah. And this is, so this is what I wanted to, when, when I read that paragraph, I thought that paragraph talked about allowing a pool height higher than 35 feet and allowing a intensity greater than 12 lumens. It wasn't clear to me that we weren't trying to step around each of each of these regulations here which you know have uh well, they're they're really pretty good as far as what's required with the lighting plan uh it talks about uh you know here here is all the duplicated stuff from that uh, earlier section that that talks about this dark sky compliance all this stuff and now we get down to this modifications thing, which is is here where we, we broke that out. And I just wanted to, at least in my mind, I wanted to make sure that we were going to continue to be able to enforce with a plan that had greater illumination than 12 lumens in greater pole height than 35 feet. Um, all these things that say what, what we expect on the lighting plan. And, and again, that gets back, uh, you know, so, so it would get to the point, uh, you know, we can, we can easily make those words require this, you know, that, uh, that exception is only uh, to allow greater intensity, greater height, but you still got to do the dark sky compliance. You still got to shield the light source so it doesn't shine across the road. And you still got to make sure the light in the neighbor's yard is less than 0.2 lumens. Um, I'm not exactly sure if that was what Eric and the town were, were thinking of when, uh, you know, we, uh, we put these, we put that little paragraph in there, but I jumped to the conclusion myself that it was all about 
more than 35 feet, more than 12 lumens in, um, it could be construed that, no, I get out of all these things. I'll give you a lighting plan that shows it's the best that it can be in, in that sort of thing. So that's what I wanted to bring to the commission tonight for when we um, do deliberate on it, we can talk about do we want to maintain those or or uh, do we uh, we think something different is there? Now, John did provide a list of, John provided uh, a pamphlet on intrusive lighting and it was, you know, a fairly extensive pamphlet. It might have been 10 pages, uh, but you, you factor that down and uh, you, you break uh, the, the land into a bunch of different areas, which ours was rural. And it gave a couple of light levels in there. And so, you know, my my sense on the intrusive light pamphlet was it was very close to the specifications that we have in here now. So we could go and put a different thing in there, but it would give us 10 pages of stuff to sort through as opposed to a half a page that's pretty concise for our little town of Andover. Um, and so at this point, uh, Eric, uh, am I misspeaking at all from uh, what you were thinking? No. So I think that what I would say is that we realized that if you were going to light a soccer field and not get have intrusive glare off of the property, the only way to do that because of the width of the soccer field, because typically what you want is you want a certain minimum angle of the light relative to the ground. Um, and, you know, or in to do that, you're going to have to have lights in the order of, of 50 to 60 feet tall if you're going to do a reasonable job of lighting a soccer field. Um, obviously, you can see from the attempt by the soccer association to use lower diesel powered lights, how bad that was. The problem with that is exactly what we're trying to avoid by having taller lights, to be able to have a sufficient down angle to illuminate the field properly, but still not, uh, you know, um, you know, just to be able to do it. Yep. As far as the total number of lumens, I mean, you're right. There are all over the map in terms of what is required or what is recommended. And if you look at the requirements of the NCAA versus a lot of, uh, you know, high school athletics versus recreational athletics, they all come up with different numbers. But the majority of them come up with new numbers that are, you know, definitely bigger than 12 lumens per square feet. So I think requiring that to be higher, you know, based on, on some certification standard would be appropriate or allowing it to be higher. But again, that's the, that's the commission's call. Okay. As far as pickleball lighting, pickleball lighting can be accomplished <clears throat> with 35 foot tall poles. Um, so it would fit within the existing special permit but you would probably want to exceed the lumens per square foot that's in the current regulations. That's it. And just to, as a point of note, uh, you know, that lighting intensities for athletic purposes, whatever that pamphlet is, it doesn't have pickleball in it. So I, I'm not sure exactly where the pickleball Reference, uh, you know, Eric, uh, and I sent on to all of you guys. Uh, I think the recommendation is 30 lumens for pickleball. Um, that was not in the standard lighting levels, if you will. So that's uh, something to keep in mind, too, that if we say go with this standard, it doesn't have any standard for pickleball. We got to make sure that it includes that. Um, any of the commission members have any comments at this point? 
Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Uh, for, for the record, Mark Brands, I, I'm a little. I was a little confused by some of your opening opening comments. As I read the proposed four point twenty one point seven, it would allow the commission to modify section four point twenty one. It would not authorize any modification of twenty three point five b. That that's that's how. You, I mean that that's fine, but it's perfectly legal. I just want to make sure that's the intent that the applicant, the town, was was seeking. That 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 twenty three five b would would continue to apply because there's no there's no modification thing in there. At least not not for recreational facilities anyway. So is that was that the intent? Is it is is the problem for the town just just four point twenty one? And, and not 23.5b? Um, no. So uh, you should see on your screen now the modification to 23.5b. Oh, okay. It, All right. It There's broke out the second section that, that does not put the 12 or the 35 limitation on for recreational fields. So that's new language then? This this here is, you know, in the existing right now. Okay. It has okay. all this stuff and it has the recreational fields up here. So our regulations today do include recreational fields. Okay. Outdoor. Yeah. Right. Oh, I see. So that's in the reg now. That's so we, all right. I understand. So we broke that out to put a separate one that didn't have that 12 or 35 limit in it. Okay. All right. Thank you. Now, Eric, you were the chair when we uh, we crafted the the first set. Do you know why the thirty five foot pole height was chosen? I think actually that was chosen because we had some existing pole mounted lights that were about that high. Okay, I was so trying we didn't to want to make our own stuff non compliant. Yep. I didn't know if that had anything to do with, uh, you know, 35 feet is about the, that is within the, the treetops. So you don't see it poking up above the treetop landscape like, uh, like the cell tower in keeping our nice pastoral views there. Any other commission members comment at this point? Yes, this is Anne. Um, yep. I remember, I can't find it now, but I remember you had sent us an email in the last few weeks with pictures of the light poles, I think, from our soccer field and then from the Manchester High School field, showing the difference in the height. Yep. And was that to show us how a taller pole would work? Now, let me uh, see remember. if I can... Okay, so the top picture yeah. here is our soccer field, and uh, mm -hmm. I certainly think that's a beautiful pastoral view, if you will. Right. Um, I did, uh, you know, I went over to Hebron to look at their lights. They don't have any. Uh, I went over to Manchester, and, uh, and, and certainly in that light intrusion pamphlet, it talked about the regulations are different from a rural area to a suburban area to a urban area. You know, they, they allow more light in the urban areas there. Um, and these lights are shining away from these homes here. So maybe that's not a problem for them. Here's another picture of our soccer field. And, and again, you can see, you know, those are the, the temporary poles here. At this point, they only had them on the one side, which was probably not in compliance with our regulations, but uh, better than, the, you know, they came up with a couple more, put them on this uh, this side of the field, shining over on the neighbor's property. And those yeah. are, and Chad, those are 18 feet. 
Yep. And and you told me what uh, what that height was. I think it was twenty something. No, the the, the, the poles on Riverside are twenty seven. Okay. Yep. The so portables anyhow, are eighteen. So that's uh, what we've got there. This is just another picture of the Manchester um, light showing. It, and I have no idea if that's what you know, we would have in our field or not. But that feels very big. And, and it would take a lot of light to evenly light it across. And, uh, and so the but, question for the commission is, uh, you know, is that the look that we want to allow but, for whatever benefit might be obtained by uh, putting them in. Go well, back to those poles, Jed, please. Back to the poles? So let's assume that's a four foot fence, which it yeah. looks like it is. There's a dugout box there. Yeah. Probably three that's feet. Four foot. Is, it, is it a four or five foot fence? Uh, I think it's You're probably right. four footer. It's not a four foot. I've yeah. been there. That's about yeah. what it is. And you know, if we go up to this one, I, I used as a guide, you know, looking at the houses and, and of course the angle, you know, puts it, but these lamps are, are taller than a house, which could be 25 feet or so. So I, I thought these were probably 60 foot poles. And that's what, uh, you know, what some of the research suggests might be required for a soccer field. I, I would say that those are, uh, Around forty. If that's a four foot fence, that's a four foot fence. Yep. Yeah. That's not ten times, Jed. I would say no. no. But I'm not going to get my uh, my ruler out and start measuring on here. You know, right. Yeah. Or, um, but this is the topic that I wanted to spend the majority of right. the time on tonight going through is uh, is uh, this stuff. So you see, you see them right away. That's your eye goes to those poles. Yep. Oh. And, and I was hoping that, uh, you know, somebody would be here that uh, one of the things that, that we will need, uh, and so we got to keep the public hearing open for this, is I was uh, hoping that somebody would be here, and maybe it's Shannon, that's going to tell us the benefit of spending all the money to put these lights in. But I don't know that there's anybody here to address that topic. Um, any other commission member comments uh, on what we've looked at so far here? Okay. Um, at this point, uh, John or Jim, any comments? Nothing further for me. Hi, this is Leanne. Can you hear me? Oh, I can hear you. Yes, Leanne. Yes. Um, first of all, it took me at least 25 minutes to get into the meeting. Um, I know you. I read your email that the passcode was different, and I and you referenced a calendar, but I tried to use the government and then planning and zoning and then minutes and agenda section of the town website which does not agree with the calendar. So I had to call Jim who told me to use the, the whole calendar because the link is different in addition to the passcode. So you bet. if anybody else tried to get in that way or anybody from the public, there's definitely a discrepancy and that's what held me up. Nope, understand. Um, so it's- I was it's just worth, thankful that we got a link that worked. Yes, it was. The inconvenient to have to sign in so late. Can somebody just quickly tell me what happened to the accessory apartment discussion? Because that was the very first item. We d we did not cover that one yet. Uh, I was waiting for Attorney Branch to uh, to join us here because he's he's uh, mm. certainly the expert on uh, on those things, and and so. I knew we had a couple of members of the public that were interested in the lighting discussion, so I just moved down and started there. Okay, so accessory apartments hasn't even been done yet? No, that's correct. No. Okay, thank you. Yep. Any other so commissioner comments? 
Okay, members of the public. Eve or Shannon? Jed. Yep. Jed, I, do know yeah, I think we covered good ground. Comment if you'll allow. Say again, Eric. I said the only thing I wanted to you you asked the question before where the standard came for the 30 or greater for light levels for pickleball courts. That was directly from the USA pickleball uh, uh, recommendation was average illuminance of 30 lumens per square foot, uniformity ratio of 0 0.7 or better, color temperature between 4,000 and 5,000 uh, for an age appropriate playing surface That's okay. from their regulations. Yep, thank you. Eva Shannon, any comments? Shannon just texted me and said she has to rejoin by phone in a few minutes. Okay, yeah. Nothing further from me. I think we covered good ground. Okay, very good. Thank you. Um, thank you. So, I mean, the, the one thing I would say is that if you are going to illuminate a soccer field, and your goal is to prevent glare from bothering the neighbors. You can't restrict the height to 35 feet. Those two things seem to be mutually exclusive. Yep. Because then the angle from the horizontal is too great. Um, and you do get significant glare off the property. So from my perspective, the, the lumens in the pole height, it, it's simply a, a yes no question if the commission doesn't feel and that's perfectly okay that because of the character of the neighborhood that they don't want to see lighting that exceeds that then that just simply means that that's not an appropriate thing and the town will not put forward a plan to light the field it's really you know that's kind of the option we're facing from my perspective I understand in uh it's it's a tough, it's a tough well it can be a tough decision to make but i think you know we need to have somebody talk to the commission about what the benefit of putting those big poles in i know it's so that kids can play soccer but you know i don't know how late uh, how late they would be going it sounds like uh, you know they're on at this time of year till eight o'clock and all that kind of stuff. Could we, we do have, we need, we need to hear what the benefit to the town is. is to, uh, is that a to good part of our meeting, Jed? Yeah, and that's gonna, well, there's nobody here to talk to it tonight, unless somebody's here that I don't know of is ready to, uh, to discuss that. But, but that's the part, you know, if it was massive utilization, then, you know, the cost and the uh, detriment of the look uh, and all that, uh, you might be worth it. If it's, uh, you know, for a handful of kids, a couple nights uh, in the fall before it gets dark, uh, I I don't know that that does. But, that, but that's information I think the commission needs to make the right decision in this case. Can I ask one clarifying question from what, about what Mr. Anderson just said, for the record, Mark Brands, the amendments that are before the commission now would would they allow the lighting that the athletic fields would need, Mr. Anderson? Yes, they would. Okay, but All right, so only so, yes. I, I was getting lost on that. Okay, so these amendments would work, and the question is whether the commission wants to adopt them or not. I'm I'm with you now. Correct. And I, I'm fully cognizant that there are some definite minuses to this. And, you know, it is the zoning commission's right to decide whether that's appropriate or not. Um, and I certainly have no hard feelings either way. But we, uh, you know, we have the ability probably to do this um, if the town desires it. Well, you know, Jed, the, the removal of the lights on the poles would be 
advantageous to the town. They're, they're hideous. Um, and to have it lit properly would be nice. But my question is, can we light it with more fixtures and less height? More fixtures and less height. No. I, I I was told that you have to, if you want to lower the height, all you have to do is add fixtures. That would be true if we wanted to add the fixtures in the center of the field. At least I I that's how I took that. We need to get it high so they can aim down and go across the field, but sort of no further. Um, and if we lower them, that's going to increase the glare. Um, I do think so, that from what I've seen, it, it would take a pole higher than 35 feet. How high? Don't know. Um, one of the things, if we were to have a special permit for this, I would expect a plan to show that uh, you know what can we do with 35 feet but but again if it, you know, there's there's not anything magic in my mind about 35 feet at this point um, so are those facts though that 60 feet is the minimum to shine to, to illuminate the whole field, that's that's it. Sixty feet, just it can't yeah. be any. Well, that is not a fact, you know, and it's all it's all a compromise. Uh, lower lower the pole, more glare, and that sort of thing. So somebody's going to. So one of the things that makes it hard to have the discussion on this without having a a study a study done already in. Uh, and I understand Eric doesn't want to do a study if, if uh, you know, because that's going to cost money or, or something. Maybe I, um, we, and I would rather, I would rather save that for the deliberation. I, uh, you know, again, my mind's not made up. Maybe, uh, you know, is. Is 60 feet altogether worse than 35? Yeah, I think they both kind of degrade the uh, the visual appeal of the field out there. But um, the height of would... those temporary lights that they were using. Do you know what the the height of the temporary generator yeah. powered lights that they had this fall were? 18 feet, Ann. 18. Okay. And, and, and those those lights like were horrible. Yeah, I uh, I yeah. I went out to look at them. So did Scott. Uh, you know, yeah, they were shining yeah, the directly, yeah, across the road into the neighbors' windows. And mm -hmm. So, it it needs to be much more than that. And uh, you know, one of the things we could do, uh, well, if we 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 don't have an application, it's just do we want to allow something. Greater than thirty-five feet, if that's what's needed, in uh, in I think I just wanted to point out to the commission that I do think that uh, you know we can achieve the right lighting levels with an increase in intensity, increase in height, and not exceed those dark sky compliance shine across the road it lumens in the neighbor's yard. Uh, issues. Don't know that for a fact. I could find out we're wrong. Uh, and if I did find out I was wrong, and, and we as a commission wanted to uh, change the regulations again, so be it. You know, we can go off and do that. Uh, as I heard at the Board of Ed, Board of Finance, Board of Selectmen meeting, the town, to, the town moves as fast as a glacier, and I may not be fast, but I can change regulations faster than that glacier can move. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, you never, you never really 
find the weaknesses in the regulations you proposed until you try to, you actually have an application to put it in. And if we have to change it again, so be it. Uh, but I think in what I read in what I've read in my research is that we can meet dark sky compliant. Uh, we can eliminate glare and we can eliminate the, uh, the light levels across the road, on the road, wherever. Can I ask a question, Jed? Yep. When you say dark sky compliant, the only way you prove you're dark sky compliant is have the American Dark Sky Society verify your setup. Is that what your intention is? Because that's an expensive proposition. Um, uh, no. And, and so if you looked at um, our regulations today, I'm going from memory here, but I think it talks about the light source not being higher than 90 degrees, which is higher than would be allowed with the intrusive light study, which I think goes up to 80 or 85 degrees or something. But, you know, I think uh, we can do a pretty good job. Well, I think our regulations cover it the way they're written today. They're they're covering what what I would like to see. Now maybe that's not good enough. I don't know, but I do think we can we can comply with what uh, our regulation has there. Let me just, uh, for the record, Mark Brits, maybe John can 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 comment on this. But in my experience, at least, uh, dark sky compliance is, is the, the fixture. The fixture you use is certified dark sky compliant. I haven't. I at least I haven't run into a, a certification by the dark sky, whatever it, it was that you said, Eric. Um, I, I haven't seen anybody requiring a certification. I've just, I've just seen the the, the fixture is dark sky. I know, John, if what, that's what you've seen. Yeah, that's that's exactly right, and it's it's more more or less used as, as that as a as a standard for the the fixture itself, and you know, to basically to describe generally, you know, cutoffs that are downward, uh, uh, lighting that is downward directed and full cutoff, so that there's not any any lateral light spread, um, and certainly nothing upward. Yeah. Um, but it's it's you know it's it sort of reflects the principles and and to a certain extent you know that's if it can be shown to have used that guide um, and and then along with the photometric plan should should um, be sufficient to satisfy the commission's desire to avoid avoid uh, light scatter. So it just you know I I found it here in the regulation four point two one point four, and it's probably mimicked in section twenty three there somewhere. Outdoor lighting shall be dark sky compatible, full cutoff type fixtures defined as a luminaire or light fixture that by design of the housing does not allow any light dispersion or direct glare to shine above a 90 degree horizontal plane from the base of the light fixture. Okay. And, nope. and I'm I, that I am absolutely fine with. I'm yep. just not fine with requiring dark sky certification because that's an expensive process. Yep. No, I got you. And, and that's why uh, after, you know, I went back and looked at all this stuff and I said, uh, you know, I think the the regulations that we have there uh, can be achieved. You know, there might be a little bit of extra cost, but I think that cost is insignificant in comparison to what it would take to put those fixtures up on those big poles. So, okay. How do we how do we get well I guess if nobody wants to come tell us what the benefit is we can act on it that way uh, but Eric or Scott I told you some of the benefits get rid of the lights that are there no oh, put up real I, lighting for the field I'm I'm looking for number of kids number of hours per year season or something yeah uh, you know that that uh, benefit from putting those lights in there? There's there's uh, three hours a day, five days a week, times two and a half months usage, Jed. How many kids? 
200 kids. 200 kids out there? The night I went out there, I was lucky to see 10. Not, not at any did. one time. Not at any just, one time. 200 but... kids in the program. Okay. Yeah. So, Jed, what they do is they basically, because they don't have enough field to practice all the kids at once and enough coaches, they, they basically practice in one and a half hour blocks. Um, and early in the year when they have lots of light, they do, I think, three or four blocks in an evening. And then as the year goes on, they shrink that up as they have less light available for the kids. So they drop down the number of training sessions per evening. Okay. That's a lot of hourly usage, Jed. Yeah. So let me ask the commissioner, are there any other things that we would want before we would deliberate on this topic at the next meeting? You know, any Jed, other information? This is Shannon. Say again? Yeah, this is Shannon. Yes, yeah, Shannon. I just wanted to add that you're only you're only talking about kids here and there's a much broader audience with regard to allowing for adult soccer. So adult soccer, I'm heading there right now to an indoor facility. Adult soccer often doesn't start until 7 or 8 o'clock at night, um, depending on the availability of the fields and whatnot. And lighting certainly would allow the town not only to have uh, the two-and-a-half-month period that, that Scott referenced, which is certainly applicable to fall soccer, but I know people, my, my child included, who pay year-round. Um, so... Yes, we need to take a look at what benefits the children and certainly the children of Andover and certainly doesn't affect uh, the across the street neighbors. Um, but there's a, a much broader um, audience in the sports world that, that could be benefited by having the lighting and benefiting the town of Andover if we decided to rent out the facility, which a number of towns do and make quite a bit of money from doing so. And just before I forget, I would be amazed if we needed 60-foot light poles. I am no expert whatsoever, but given the current height of our light poles, which I think Scott said were 27 feet, I think that maybe 40 to 45 feet, um, but that's only if we're going to have lighting, which sounds like it's what is planned or what was thought of from one side of the field. Um, I don't know if there's any ability to come from the other side of the field, and certainly that is what affected the across the street neighbors and the Chichiellos. Um, so that's just my input for right now. But let's not just deal with talking about two and a half months for children. You've got a whole broad community of adults um, who will pay to play on our fields. Plus, we're, we're entertaining at this time um, football tournaments for the Ram uh, soccer, Ram football. Okay. Anybody else have any other comments on lighting? Um, there's been a little bit of mention of the picket pickleball courts. Um, I guess they'd be off on the side, not right on the soccer field, but uh, with the lighting for that would be also an important thing. Because I'm sure people would use that in the evening too. Yes. And and so we're we're looking at you know, Eric said he was confident that they could come up with a plan that did not exceed 35 foot in height. Um, yeah. But we would we would want to exceed 12 lumens in on the court. And uh, yeah, up to 30. Lumens. Yeah, up to 30. And um, so. That uh, that comes into play too. Yep, but but again, we uh, we don't have an application for an actual field or anything right now. We're just trying to come through. Would we entertain that? Um, okay. I would like to hold this section of the public hearing open until the next meeting. Make sure that nobody else comes in. I think this is. This is the one that people in the public might 
most want to hear about in uh And so that's that's what I'd like to do is continue this public hearing to the next meeting. And okay, I see Eve and Shannon, is there any other particular section there of the regulations that you would like to hear about uh, while you're here tonight? No, well, while Mark's here now, we can go back to accessory apartments, can we? Well, we we can. I uh, I I don't know that we're going to make it through all the changes tonight, um, but I'd like to get I'd like to hear from what the public would like to hear about and uh, take advantage of that too, well, along with having Mark here. Thank you very much, Jed. This is Shannon. Um, Nothing else right now. I'll just listen because um, there were other regulation changes that you're considering um, that caught my attention and that I might have an interest in, in having input. But I think this was the extent right now of the lighting and dealing with the uh, potential for the field. So thank you very much for allowing me to speak. Okay. Thank you, Shannon. Eve? This is Eve. I just want to say thank you for your time and we covered everything I was interested in covering. Okay. Thank you very much for uh, joining us tonight. I uh, I enjoy and need to hear you know, the public's opinion, and we don't get enough of it. So thank you. It's my pleasure. Um, so at this point, we will go back up to the accessory apartment one. And and we as the commission have uh, you know talked about this quite a bit. Um, over the last year, maybe a glacier does go faster than uh, we've been able to get this one put to bed. The uh, since since we looked at it as a group last time, the uh, a couple of different facts came to my attention, but uh, Attorney Brantz put in deed restriction words. I kind of envisioned that being a different boilerplate thing outside of this, uh, but no, it makes sense that it's actually in the regulations as to what's going on. And this talks about uh, you know the renter's income and the, and the rent and all that kind of stuff. The uh, the other thing that that uh, when I saw this surprised me a little bit was uh, Mark is recommending that we have the deed restriction for a minimum period of forty years. And uh, as we look back at uh, Public Act 2129, it talked about accessory apartments could be 10 years. Um, what, uh, what I don't remember if we talked about with the commission or not is that at the end of that 10 years, then the uh, if it's no longer deed restricted, it no longer counts for affordable housing and 10 years goes by awful quick. And uh, and so Mark's recommendation was to make that 40 years. And I think that's his standard wording for other folks, other towns. Um, I think the, oh, so, so I've got uh, an inconsistency here that uh, you know, this talks about 10 years. We as a commission need to decide if, uh, you know, 10 years or 40 years is the right number. Um, the other thing that we, the only other change that I think since we've talked about it is we had a definition of architectural plans and that uh, we, we reduced that in scope a little bit to highlight what it was we were looking for with, uh, with an accessory apartment. Attorney Branch recommended we change that to call those floor plans because they weren't really architectural plans. Architectural plans had more stuff. And so I did that. And, and I also changed the, uh, in the definition section, what we had to, to floor plans there. Um, I, I think that that was good that you did that, Jed. It was, there was nothing. Yeah, there, there was nothing, and uh, 
Now we have two. We have a definition for architectural plans and one for floor and plans. And floor plans, right, yeah. So that, uh, that is all that I've got uh, to brief on what the proposed change is. Again, after we close the public hearing, we can deliberate that. I'm not sure we'll get there tonight. I, I don't want to keep us here too late. Uh, I know this is holiday week and all that. And everybody's busy. But um, any questions from the commission at this point on the change? I have a question. Go ahead, Leanne. Leanne, um, is the 10 year or 40 year, right now, is it either or for us to decide or are there towns that are, you know, anywhere in between seeing there's such a gap? I don't have an opinion on it um, tonight. I'm, I'm asking for next time um, if there's towns that are in between there because there is such a you know, a time period in between 10 years and 40 years. Mr. Okay. Chairman. Go ahead, Mark. Yep. Yeah. Um, the 830G is 40 years. 813O, which is the incentive housing, is 30 years. Um, uh, some towns, when, when it's their own, they can't do this under 830G, but if it's their own problem or, or make, like for housing authority type things, they're making it perpetual. So there's really no... That, that the, the 40 is 830G, the 30 is 813O, and it, it can be any number you pick. It's just that you only get the points, the affordable housing points, for the period of the of the restriction. Okay, thanks. Huh. Any other questions or comments on the accessory apartments? That's something that we need to remember, that you only get the points. Yes, and in yeah. one of the things, and I don't know that uh, I will express it as well as John did when we were reviewing these the other day a little bit, um, but it's a policy matter, and an attorney branch is we we can either you know there's a choice we can either try to maximize affordable housing that doesn't count, make it as easy as possible, or we can try to enforce affordable housing that does count because we know the state is continuing to tighten up the reins there, or we can split the difference. Um, my, my sense is that we are gonna do something here. I really don't care what it is. And we're gonna figure out how it goes and then we're gonna end up changing it to influence the outcome more of where we want it. But when attorney Brandt says, I strongly encourage you to make it 40 years. And if anybody challenges this, I'm the guy that has to go to court and defend you. And I would like to defend you by showing that the planning and zoning commission is at least trying as hard as they can to uh, make affordable housing that counts He's got a better leg to stand on to uh, to defend us there. So my that's it exactly. My <laughs> sense would be, I always like to go with what the attorney recommends. <laughs> but it, it, but it is a it is a matter of policy though. Yep. So I'm I'm only saying that because what what I what I what I've indicated is, you know, someday maybe someday soon you're going to need and get an 830G application that you really really don't like. And and you're going to want to deny it, and you're going to want me to help you win in court when you deny it. And basically, the higher your percentage is at um, at that moment in time, the more the more units you've got. At the, whenever that happens, the stronger a case I can make. It's that's all there is to it. Yep. Um, I have a question with with this regulation about the forty years. Does this influence just like the in-law apartment kind of thing. Um, my home, when we built it 17 years ago, I guess it didn't have this accessory apartment stuff at that time in the, in the uh, zoning. We built a small apartment on for my in-laws. And um, I don't know how this regulation of this 40 year thing 
would have influenced or affected our ability to build that. I know in our neighborhood, there are at least three of us that have in-law apartments. And I know of others, other parts of town. Um, I'm just concerned about, is this limiting what we can do for our family like this? In, in the answer to that, Ann, is that I don't think it's limiting it. In fact, uh, so we say that you can build an ex we you can build an affordable accessory apartment for all these requirements as of right. You don't have to go to a public hearing. Don't have to go with a special permit. Um, but if you don't want it to be affordable, then you have to go to public hearing and special permit. Okay. I'm not sure that's. My concern is that everybody's going to go the special permit route because they don't want the burden of making it affordable. Yeah. And that, you know, if we find that that's how that goes, then, you know, we may want to tweak on the regulation a little bit. Uh, what would be nice, and, and Steve, you know, mentioned this before, he'd rather see carrots as opposed to sticks. And yeah, like Eric the way is, we did it my in-laws paid us a big chunk of money, which we figured was about the percentage of the total house of their percentage yep. for how much it cost to build. So they weren't paying us rent later on. Nope. I got you. I don't know yep. if that affects something like this, the rules for it, this. It, uh, a little bit, but you could do it by special permit in, in, uh, what I was trying to say about the the uh, the carrots is, you know, some towns provide a tax incentive to the people mm. who make an affordable housing thing. I see. I'm not ready to tackle that right this minute, but um, certainly one of the things that we as a commission have on our side now is I've got half the board of selectmen on the planning and zoning commission. <laughs> and so you would think that, uh, you know, what we really need to, to make this affordable housing stuff take off is a housing commission. I don't want to go back to the board of selectmen at this point. I just got done spending two years trying to get a town planner. And they're going to say, it hasn't even been a year. And now you're back here asking for the next guy. But it's a, it's a housing group that needs to uh, figure out how do we incentivize people to want to make affordable housing. Mm -hmm. yeah. you know, okay. We we can't do that through planning and zoning. At least, at least I can't. We're going to have elections later tonight. If somebody thinks they can, now's your chance. But but that's um, uh, my, my just, concern. Is it's, well, let me just add what well, Trim is first. The, the zone, there are options for zoning alone. You can, for example, give density bonuses for affordable, including affordable housing. You can require the inclusion of affordable housing in subdivisions or other developments. The statutes yeah. authorize it. The problem for Andover is let, let's suppose let's suppose let's suppose you picked twenty percent. You wanted twenty percent affordable units in in a development. You don't get that many subdivisions with twenty lots. Right, and yep. so you can, you you would have or, or ten lots even. You know, if you say twenty percent, it's got to be at least that's two out of ten. And you just, I mean, it, larger towns with larger subdivisions have had some success with this, but I think it's difficult for you because most of your subdivisions are smaller than that. But it is an option. The, the the power is there. The authority exists. And I, Chad, if I might, go ahead. So yeah, the, for the record, John Justkowski. Um, yeah, the, ultimately, the, it, it is a, it is a policy choice, and you have to sort of ask yourself what are you trying to do. And I think Mark Mark's suggestion about a forty year restriction um, absolutely answers the question correctly. If the question is we want to, you know, be um, sort of visibly proactive in providing in, in ensuring that accessory units are affordable. Um, I, I do think there is, you know, a trade-off as you as you say, Jed, that if the commission's real goal is to encourage proliferation of these units, you know, a 40-year restriction is a disincentive. 
um, and and people would not necessarily be inclined to do it without some other offsetting incentive, as you said, Jed, possibly with a tax incentive, possibly with administrative assistance, just to help do income verification or something like that, so the paperwork is not such a burden. Um, so it it is a trade off, but again, I think generally speaking, the volume of act of, of development activity in, in generation of new housing units is relatively slow in Andover, such that, you know, if we are hearing that people are disincentivized from it or a year goes by and, and we don't get a single application, you know, then you can then you can look to sort of turn those dials a little bit in a different direction. But again, if if um, you know, the, the concern that the state is going to be coming down um, somewhat harder on, on communities to demonstrate their forward progress in providing affordable housing. You know, a regulation like this is demonstration that the town is is trying something. And the market may tell you it is not working in Andover, but but it is a, a worthy attempt. And I do think, uh, you know, from the news reports that you read, what you hear coming out of the state, uh, it is going to get you know, affordable housing is a huge issue in Connecticut, and it's only going to get bigger in uh, in the state legislature has said they are going to be focusing on housing in the next session. So I, I think it will come that way. But anyhow, um, Leanne, you were interested in this one. Did uh, did you get a, did we cover everything you wanted to hear? Yes, yes, I think some some new terminology was brought up and, and some ideas that Attorney Brantz gave us um, about density and there were there were two or three more. So um, I mean, I'll listen to it again when it comes up on the you know the town YouTube channel, but um, yes, but basically, I think we covered a lot now that we're on this topic. Okay. Um, and being that, it is 8.33. I am thinking now would be, we, we've gone through the two topics that I think will take the most discussion. I think the rest of them are fairly quick, but I don't want to rush through them. And I do want to, you know, we've got some other stuff to, uh, to talk about on the agenda tonight. Um, so it would be, there'd be great disappointment if we continued the public hearing to the next meeting and, uh, and wrapped up the uh, last couple of things then, and then did the deliberation on it. Hearing- As long as we, we can do that procedurally, even though we haven't discussed them tonight. If, if you keep the public hearing open, you can bring up new issues, ask new questions, any any person who wasn't who couldn't get into the Zoom meeting for technical reasons will be able to raise questions anew. Um, the, the the commission is not allowed to make any decisions until the hearing closes, so it is it is still a completely open process as long as the public hearing is open. You you will need to announce the 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 date and the uh, time and the method of the next meeting. That is to say, uh, whether it will be virtual or live. Okay, should we do that now? So so I think your question, Leanne, is we do not have to cover everything that we set the public hearing for tonight to be mm -hmm. legal. Correct. Yes, that was my question, because yep. we don't, this doesn't usually happen, so I was right. just double checking. Nope, but getting a late start and, uh, you know, it's already past 8.30, um, mm -hmm. and we've got a couple other things that I want to make sure we get a, a chance to talk about a little bit tonight. So at this point, at 8.35, we will continue the public hearing at our next meeting on December 19th. And at 8.36, I will call the regular meeting. And Mr. Planning. Chairman, will that be will that be will that be also virtual or um or live on the 19th? I am, I am planning on it being virtual at this point. Okay, well, we just have to say for the for for and let we unless we're going to re-advertise it, okay. But if you to avoid the cost of another legal ad, as long as we say say now, it'll be the nineteenth 
at 7 p.m. virtually okay with the with the connection being on on you know on the printed on the agenda that should be fine now i may not be able to be there the 19th um it it appears that i can't i'll put it on the calendar and i'll see what happens okay yep yeah. and uh i think you have guided us uh, in a lot of good areas here mark and so uh we'll do the best we can if you're not able to make okay. it okay all righty We'll we'll be shooting you emails uh, on any questions that come up. Okay. I am going to I'm hunting for my agenda here. Okay, we called the meeting to order at eight thirty six. <clears throat> Roll call seating of alternates. I see Ann Creme is here, Steve Nelson, Scott Person. Leanne Hutchinson and myself. So Susan, no need to be uh, seated tonight. Um, just a note on the election. You know, uh, I don't know if everybody heard, but uh, you know, we had two Democrats running, and with Susan being a Democrat, we can't have three Democratic alternates. And so there's only going to be one of the people that were up for on the ballot uh, joining us, and I have not heard who that is yet. Uh, so. More to follow on, on there for but for the time being, Susan, you're our, our only alternate. So thank you for coming. Um, Jed, do you want to stop sharing your screen so we can see oh, each other? Good idea. Thank you. And and uh, I always appreciate the forceful backup to uh, help me do the right thing. Uh, Mr. Chairman, do you, do you want me to remain? Are there other items you, you'll need me for? I am looking, and the only item I have for you, Mark, that you need to stick around for is I hope you have a happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> Thank you, and the same to all of you as well. Yeah, and, and you did see my uh, comment on the uh, the schedule for the meetings. We avoided- Yes, uh, I did, that we're, uh, that we're okay. Yeah, I just didn't know- yeah. Yeah, yep. we've we've had a couple. We had this 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 year. Rosh Hashanah created some real problems in in a couple of our towns. So I when I as people are setting meetings, I'm trying to alert them. So that I'm glad to hear that. Well, yes, happy Thanksgiving to all, and uh, I'll we'll, we'll, we'll certainly be in touch. Be in touch. All right. Yep. Bye bye. Good night. Thank you, Mark. Next up is additions or changes to the agenda, and I have none. Anybody else want to add anything? Probably not. I think we got enough. Okay, we're going to move on. Uh, public comment. Uh, Shannon, are you still with us? We got off. Oh, okay. Yep. This, this is Catherine Hutchinson. Can you hear me? I can hear you, Catherine. Yep. Oh, yes. Um, I had um, a, a question. Okay. At the excuse me, at the November meeting under Old Business Five B update on the Five Seventeen Route Six gravel pit, and I'm going to read you from the minutes. Jim Halsey provided update, reached out to the land use attorney, spoke with another attorney at the firm, reviewing information regarding gravel pit. Leanne Hutchinson weighed in on property dash. <clears throat> look at potential courses of action calling bond. Jim will follow up with an update for the next meeting. So my question is, will that be done tonight? The follow-up by Jim be done tonight under section 8A, or will that be deferred to the December meeting? It's probably going to be both. Um, I think uh, he will provide an update tonight. Jim, do you want to address that issue right now? Jim, you're muted. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to take it that Jim does not want to address that right now. We'll we'll get to it, but we will. We I'm will sorry. not. Uh, Can you hear me get... now? Oh, yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Jim. I'm sorry. I'm, I I didn't realize I didn't mute it. Uh, I did finally speak to Alan Corto, who who is an attorney with Mark at Halloran and Sage. Um, actually, I. I I left a message. I didn't speak to him. Um, 
I left a message. I have not heard back from him. So I really have very little to offer. Um, he He's working on it. He indicated he was working on it. But that's all the information I have. I, I can't move forward until I hear from him. And I have not, other than just a brief message. And Catherine, I know that Jim tried to lasso Mark Brantz in, and uh, Mark did not take the bait. All right. Well, thank you. Um, so so is, 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 uh, I appreciate Jim doing his report now so that uh, otherwise I would remain on until the portion of the agenda that he normally also reports on other matters. So everybody have a great Thanksgiving and we'll see everybody next month. Thank you. And I appreciate, you, I appreciate you, your, I appreciate your uh, taking my question and responding and getting it resolved for tonight. Thank you. And again, everybody have a great You're welcome. Thanksgiving. Thank you. Yeah. Right. Can I ask, may I ask a question in pursuant to that? Yep. Go ahead. Um, since Mark is, you know, handling other matters, obviously tonight, for example, for us, but Jim is now dealing with another attorney in Mark's firm about the gravel pit. Is this second attorney just going to be assigned to the gravel pit um, topic from now on, or is there some kind of a transition, or is this just Mark has moved this particular topic to this other attorney? Is it temporary? Do we know? We probably don't know for sure. And, you know, Mark did not stick around after we got done discussing regulation changes the other day because the weather was nice and his boat was calling. And so uh, when Jim thought he was going to be able to uh, bend Mark's ear for a little bit, that did not come to pass. But I did hear Mark say that this other fella is doing the regulatory the enforcement actions for Halloran and Sage now. So um, okay. that's that's where that stands. So Jed, okay. maybe that's I can maybe, yes, maybe I can shed a little bit of info on that if you'll allow me to speak. Go and ahead. that is I did I did have that conversation with Mark uh, myself um about three weeks ago it wasn't specifically related to this but he basically said yeah he's very much staying involved in doing the zoning matters um but he's trying to step away from the areas that there are people in the company that are better served um you know are are better at it um, he's done this before uh, i mean he's referred us to other attorneys within halloran and sage there's another Halloran and Sage attorney that is working on a, a specific matter with the town. You know, again, it's one I would have given to Mark, but Mark just flat out said, you know, if that's what you're looking for, you know, I'm not the guy to do that. Um, so I think that's the case with this also. Okay. Thanks, Eric. Thank you. Yep. That does help. Thank you. And I think uh, that I don't see any other public members here. So we're going to move on to uh, new business. We will not discuss the proposed amendment changes. Next item in new business is nomination of officers, chairperson and vice chairperson, election at following meeting per the bylaws. So after we have an election, which we have had in, uh, we, uh, We've got uh, the regular commission members that we had before still on the commission. So it is time to uh, choose the chairman and the vice chair for the next two years. And I am willing to be chairman or vice chairman, only one for the next two years. Uh, but if somebody else wants to do that, uh, I will not be offended. So that's uh, that's where I'll go 
on that. I did ask Ann if she was willing to be vice chair again. And uh, she said that she was. So, um, but I'm not going to nominate I myself. I, I'll nominate you, Jed. I nominate Jed Larson um, as planning and zoning chairman. I'd like I'll to second. second. Uh, okay, waiting for Susan. Did you second? Yes, I did. And I think uh, we we allow the entire membership to vote, so that is okay, even though you're not seated. Um, any other nominations for chairman? Again, I'm going to be offended. <laughs> okay, hearing none. Um, I'll call for a vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstain? So the motion passes 6-0-0. Zero, zero. I will nominate Ann Cremay as vice chair. Second. Thank you, Steve. Any other nominations for vice chair? Hearing none, I'll call for a vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstaining? Motion passes 600. Thank you, Ann. Welcome. Moving on to old business. John, you had uh, a little bit for us on planet conservation development, I think. Well, it can be as short or as long as we want. That wouldn't be sensitive to the time. Uh, the, the thing that I was working on next after we had kind of reviewed the, the, the goals from the 2015 plan was um, I was looking to put together a public survey on, on priorities and preferences um, and started with the... Um, the long-term plan survey, um, which uh, is online. Um, and if Marina, if you would let me share my screen. I, I, Mr. Chair, as she's doing that, I'll just ask, uh, tell how much how much time or how quickly do you want me to, uh, to, to wrap up this section? Okay, John, you should be good to share whenever. Thank you. Um, 15 or 20 minutes. Okay, I'll, I'll try to make the best use of that. So um, I went through, uh, hopefully people can see this. This is yep. a summary of the long-term plan um, survey that was done in 2019. Um, and a number of the things, again, was because this was largely about town facilities and town improvements um, and, and use of town resources. So um, I wanted to focus on those elements that sort of overlap cleanly with things we would want to know for a plan of conservation and development. Um, and the things that we might want to re-ask in a survey would include um, the ones that I boxed in red, which is, do you support the development of a town center, which was interesting, um, basically an even split of those surveyed. Do you support in reestablishing a Main Street in Andover actually had um, a significantly negative response. Only, only a little over a third were in favor. Um, there were se there were several questions about how often do people use specific services, or do you do you support bikeable and walkable things? Do you use the Hop River Trail? Um, I wasn't necessarily interested in those for a plan of conservation and development, but did like asking the questions such as um, what types of businesses would you like to see in town. Um, and should the town be actively marketing undeveloped commercial properties in town? And those um, was that was generally supported. About two thirds did support that. Um, there were questions about the farmers market and and the way that town government and functioned and got information out. That again is not necessarily um, a POCV scope, but um, also 
thought it would be worth taking um, what services are not available in Andover that you would like to see uh, as, as sort of an open-ended um, and then asking some of the demographics questions. Um, so my, my first thought was taking some of those um, and building a survey around it. Um, and my, my thoughts about survey topics. Okay. Before uh, you, before you yeah. go on, John, of course, the, uh, so all those, things you know, were kind of towards the top about the seniors in that, you know, I thought some of that would be if we had a chapter in the POCD like we do now on preparing for an aging population, I, mm -hmm. uh, I thought a few of those would probably be worth continuing. We, we need to address that area somehow. Um, and certainly the, do you support a walkable, bikeable, a safer route 316? I, uh, that, yeah, what, what's interesting is that was that was fairly evenly split as well. Yep, yep. Um, so I wasn't ready to cross all those topics off yet. I, uh, no, and, I, and I, I, I agree that I don't think the, topic, the topics as a whole should be um, crossed off. I didn't necessarily think that they need to be asked that same way. Um, and so, uh, and this is a very rough outline and some, some, some initial thoughts would be to ask questions in a few categories that, that sort of tracked um, the themes of the previous POCD, um, which is asking some questions in the theme of residential development, asking people about their opinions about, you know, affordable housing and type of housing, senior housing um, and, 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 and in part to to rank or a rate on a scale, not just agree, disagree, but sort of gauging strength of opinion on some of these things. Similarly, with commercial development and the town's role in that, um, asking a few questions about open space and natural resources, uh, as well as transportation, community connections, um, and then and then getting into some of those community services, like schools, um, like parks and rec and particularly for senior services um you know asking a question about the development of the center or, or programming that they would like to see involved there as well as transportation as a separate category and then to some open-ended questions about people's hopes or dreams or concerns um for the looking forward for the next 10 years um and then and then finally sort of you know getting the the baseline are you a property owner, property renter? Are you, you know, what's your age demographic? And if people are willing to share, you know, general income um, limits in an anonymous sort of way. Um, so I, I think keeping some of those things in, but but rephrasing them and recategorizing them in the categories of the theme of the of the POCD um, would be something that I would sort of recommend structuring it. Um, and then I also had. You know, some e example of um, a survey that we did in the town of Old Saybrook that I shared with Jed and Eric um, that I won't I won't get into um, this evening, but wanted to sort of get some feedback about if, if people are what I would suggest again, because of time constraints um, is to propose if, if people sort of agreed with the concept of taking some stuff from the long term plan but reframing them in, in sort of the, the POCD themes, um, I'd be happy to put together a draft survey um, for review and discussion at the next meeting. So I think that sounds great. Uh, you know, for the commission, I would ask each commission member, you know, to think about what kind of questions you want to make sure get in there so that you're ready to discuss it. And then, uh, you know, one of the things that Eric did with the commission back when he was just starting on the long-term plan that I thought was very good was he said, you know, what, what is that thing? Or, you know, a couple of things that you would like to see in Andover 10 years from now that we need to be heading towards. And so, you know, at least at the top of my list before it was a senior center. So now I have to go think up something new, <laughs> but, uh, 
but what is it that we want the town to be? And and I think, you know, for myself, it's probably, uh, you know, the affordable housing senior, it can be single family homes or, you know, little uh, multifamily uh, things, but, you know, we need, we need some affordable mixed with non-affordable or market priced, uh, you know, we need new ho housing development for the seniors to live in to, uh, you know, continue to be able to stay in Andover is, I guess, now at the top of my list uh, on that. But I really need the input from uh, from you folks on, you know, what do you think uh, Andover needs? Um, and I do think that uh, Eric and the town have done a, you know, a great job of, uh, you know, continuing to work on, on the list that we've had before. And, uh, but it's time to take a look at that. I guess the other thing uh, I would ask John is we make sure that, you know, one of the questions uh, that you might've had it in there is, do you support uh, open space, purchasing land for open space in, you know, one, I may not be ready to go to the board of selectmen and ask for money for uh, a housing authority, but I do think it's time that we start putting at least a small chunk away on a routine basis to build up the pot that we have in case a nice piece of property becomes available for open space and we want to go buy it. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Open space is a is a is definitely a category that we would yeah. want to want to explore, and I think and and in case like that, um, have sort of ranked ranked choice, not just sort of yes or no, do you support open space? But if we were, you know, targeting open space, would we want to build on a state forest, for instance, would we want recreation land? Would we want, you know, municipal facilities and and kind of rank some of those things in, in terms of priority? And in the long-term study plan, I, I don't know how they worded the question, but, you know, one of the takeaways was that people were willing to pay increased taxes to support the school, open space, and conservation. Those were the three things that people were willing to pay a little bit more for. And uh, I'd like to validate that that's still true. Because we we haven't added any, oh, well, we've added a little bit of open space, but not much to that deficit that we have that we're trying to create. So I, I would, I, you know, what I, I'd be happy to, you know, sort of circulate my outline, um, but it may just be as easy to, respond to a draft survey um, itself and then identify areas where we aren't asking enough questions or asking the right questions so we can you know identify what what's missing i'd be happy to have you take a crack at a draft and and then we can add to it to comment on it uh, um might not be the next meeting that's right before christmas and and we do have a fair amount of uh you know, the yeah. public hearing That's deliberation fine. to That's do, fine. but, but, uh, you know, at least we're ahead of the, ahead of the problem with where we want to go. Might not get it all done at the next meeting, but at least we're, uh, we're not sitting here wondering what's, what's next. Okay. Any other commission members have any thoughts on that? Okay. Um, and I think you only used up 10 minutes, John. So uh, well done on that. The uh, next up is uh, discussion and action of the application town of Andover site plan review of proposed development at the public safety complex. Um, Eric, I did not, I looked online today and I did not see a site plan online. It may not have been online, but it was submitted with the application. Okay. So the application does include a site plan. Um, for general purposes, if you, and, and I apologize because I'm not at my desk at work or else I would pull it up uh, from there. But um, the location is directly behind the fire department directly adjacent to the two existing propane tanks. Um, there is 
you you couldn't take action on this tonight anyway because the wetlands yeah. commission has not made a ruling on it um so but but that is the location the the goal here is simply to add two additional propane tanks one of which will feed the andover town hall which will be converted to both buckless split systems as well as a propane boiler and propane furnace for the community room. Uh, and then what I'm doing is I'm setting the town up for a grant, a FEMA grant application for a new generator that will be, uh, will cover the municipal complex. In other words, it will cover the fire department, the uh, new community uh, center, as well as the town hall to replace the 30 some odd year old existing diesel generator that's there with a propane one. Um, that's that's what we're looking to do basically with this application. Okay, and uh, <clears throat> yeah, it's probably not worth uh, me going. I, I know that uh, that site plan exists under the Inland Wetlands website because we looked at it there at that last meeting, but uh, we'll we'll show that next month then when uh, yeah. we we get to that. And uh, I think yes. that's pretty easy to take care of. There was a checklist prepared for this application, uh, and there was a couple of couple of um, unchecked boxes. One was was wetlands, as you mentioned. The other was eastern highlands, and I don't know whether that has been reviewed. They've reviewed it, it has, yet or not. It has been submitted, but it has not been. I do not have a definitive. A response back from EHHD. Although I did discuss it with that and show him the original plans. And he said, okay. yeah, you'll get it, but you still got to submit the application, which I did. Okay. I'll make sure the checklist and the and the plan are on the on the website for the next meeting. Yeah. Any questions for Eric on uh, on the propane tank plan? Okay. Next item up is approval of commission meeting dates for calendar year 2024. When uh, we were coming up with the agenda, uh, I had not reviewed the minutes yet, and I didn't think that we had actually made a motion and approved those dates. We did, and those dates are you know, right on. They're the third Tuesday of every month. I, I've got a list of them. I'll send those in to Carol, and, uh, and that'll be that. So no further action on the uh, commission dates for next calendar year. There is a typo in that line uh, when we get to approving the minutes and we'll we'll fix that up, but uh, the information in there is correct. So next up is the approval of the minutes. And I will make a motion to approve the minutes from our regular meeting on October 17th. And I thought you said there was a typo. Well, we will. We'll discuss that after <laughs> uh, we, we get a second there. Second. Sec second. Okay. Thanks, Steve. Um, the only uh, correction I had was where it talks about the minutes. It says setting regular meeting dates for the 2022-2023 fiscal year and it's actually for the 2024 calendar year. And that was the only change that I had to the minutes. Uh, anybody else have anything? Hearing none, I'll, I'll call for a vote to uh, approve the minutes as amended. And uh, Ann? Ann, you're muted. Uh, oh, I thought you're... I was out. Okay. Yeah. Aye. Steve? Aye. Scott? Aye. Leanne? Aye. And I vote aye as well. Uh, the motion to approve the minutes is amended 
passes 5 0 0. Next item up is administrative reports in, in Jim Europe first. Okay, well, I covered, I believe, 517 Route 6 gravel pit. It appears to be relatively stable despite the lack of topsoil. Um, and I hope to, to have a conversation with Attorney Corto and see what, how to proceed. Um, 664 Route 6, ongoing blight issue. Um, Is that Steve Burnett? Steve Burnett, yes. Yeah, okay. Um, working with, with attorney O'Brien on that. Um, a few other light complaints. Um, I, I did resolve one on at 92 Merritt Valley Road, but another involved removal of two, two vehicles. And apparently the, the material that was in all the vehicle, one was a truck, a box truck, um, has subsequently been, is now piled on the, on the front yard. So I have a, a, another Another violation, I have a, a drug violation on Long Hill Road that I'm, I'm in the middle of pursuing a um, few others. A lot of, uh, well, a, a modest amount of, of additions coming in this time of year. I do have a, an issue that I'm just going to raise, uh, just bring it up um, back to 664 Route 6. Um, the, 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 current, the property owners is trying to sell the property and became aware of the fact that it appears to be zoned residential. And his recollection was that it, that it was changed to commercial. And uh, a few other people had the same, same, um, same recollection. So I went back through the minutes and apparently there was in fact a zone change application submitted Back, I want to say 2016 or 2013. I'm not, I'm not positive offhand. Um, the application was approved, but a plan, a zoning map was never filed. Um, there was a, a document filed in the land records. It was labeled a special permit alluding to the zone change. Um, so at this point, I, I, I'm trying to work, work through this um, I have no no actual plan at all. There was no plan that was was in the in a file. There was no plan filed. There was no plan in the file that came, seemed to come in with with the application, or at least it was not apparent. Um, so I'm trying to work through this. Although I don't know exactly what I'm going to do. Uh, I, there is there is a plan of the property. Um, you know, mylar, and I I don't know where that plan came from, um, but I'm, I'm working on it. Um, the applicant was not apparently aware that it was his responsibility to, to file the plan and um, obviously didn't. So I just bring it up, bring this up um, because it will probably come back before you in some shape or form. Um, if not at the next meeting um, following, sometime following that. About other than that, that's I, I have nothing. Any questions for Jim? Do you know why he was changing it to commercial, Jim? Yes, I mean, he had a plan to to develop that. You know, I vaguely remember hearing some some plans to develop in commercial capacity, but I. I mean, it was before my time, but um, I do remember it coming up. I mean, I, th I think he thinks it would increase the property value and give him an opportunity to sell. It's about a four-acre parcel, um, and as you know, it's it's um, it's open in front. It's it, there's been some cleanup going on, um, but it still it still has a lot of junk on it. But but he's I mean he he assumes that he'll, he'll be able to get rid of it. You'll be able to sell it and sell it at a better price. If it's commercially zoned. I mean, there are other commercial zo commercially zoned properties in that area. As you probably know, I mean, it is on Route Six. It's not a it's not an unreasonable request. But it would be in uh, you know adjacent to residential on both sides, or is it? Uh, At least so, yes. Across the street is commercial, but. 
but either side would be residential, yes. Okay. That might be a good thing for us as a commission to, to think about is what should the commercial zone look like 10 years from now? You know, if you if happen, anybody remembers back when Rosewood Acres was approved, and I don't know when that was, but roughly 10 years ago, um, there were a number of commercial lots in that subdivision. Yeah. Yep. Right along Route 6. There still are. Yeah. Yep. But that's quite a distance from, uh, you know, the Burnett property. But anyhow, we'll, we'll let... Uh, yeah. We'll let you work on that one for a little bit. And uh, my concern was that he wanted to come and ask the commission what we were going to do to fix his problem and wasn't ready to go there yet because didn't know anything about it. So Jim's off working that one for us. Inlet wetlands and water course slaves on, as Eric said, uh, you know, we, we will be, uh, uh, first week of December when we have that meeting, we'll be working on approval of the wetlands permit uh, to support the propane tank thing. So um, that's uh, that's all I've got to report from Inland Wetlands. Any, uh, any commission discussion miscellaneous topics for tonight? I have a question. Yep, go ahead. Um, there's an available real estate sign at the Andover Plaza, and there are now two vacant businesses, because unfortunately, in, in addition to Oriental Walk closing, the Mini Mart guy went out of business. Um, and a lot of times when you see these signs, it'll say space available, if there's one or more spaces available. Does anyone know if the whole <laughs> plaza is up for sale? or if they're advertising that there's one or more vacant storefronts, but not the whole place. I can answer that if you want. Yeah, go ahead, Eric. The owner is advertising for the vacancy. He is not advertising for selling the plaza at this point. Okay, thank you. Yep. Any other miscellaneous topics? Okay, um, I don't think there's anybody from the public left for a public comment. Next, uh, next regularly scheduled meeting is December 19th. And that will be uh, virtual as well. I hope that it's raining out now so that I can say, aren't you thankful that we're meeting virtually? <laughs> it wasn't raining when we started, but uh, the weatherman promised that by now it would be. Um, and I just want to wish everybody a happy Thanksgiving and uh, you appreciate uh, all the support. Um, kind of had a goal of getting done by 930 tonight, which wasn't too awful bad. And, we're, we're going early, so that's uh, that's all good. Uh, but uh, I really appreciate the uh, the discussion, the input, and in, uh, trying to keep me honest. So uh, so thank you very much uh, for all the support on that. Um, other than happy Thanksgiving, I guess that brings us to uh, adjournment. Nine fifteen. I make a motion to adjourn. Second that. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstaining? Thank you very much, everybody, and uh, have a great Thanksgiving, and we'll see you in December. You too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Good night, everybody.